morning. My name is Jorge Soberon, professor at the University of Kansas. I will be giving a presentation on some conceptual or theoretical perspectives on the idea of presence or occurrence data. And the, the presentation I'm going to give is very much based uh, or a follow-up follow of the uh, presentation that Town Peterson uh, gave before. The first thing I would like to remind you about is that observations, being the uh, presences or absences, occur in geographic space. Um, a researcher will go to a particular spot in geography and she will record whether a species is present or is not observable during the time and with the methods she used. And that is uh, um, the, observ the, the, the observation. However, from the perspective of ecological niche modeling, we are interested not on the geography, but on the environmental values. And that's where Hutchinson's duality uh, will come in place again uh, there is uh, this one-to-one -one relationship between places in geography and places in environmental space. Um, so it's very simple, right? You just go and, and take uh, measures in space and that those are your presences. Well, this simplicity is really apparent as we will see. So what do we need to, to have presences? Apparently, you, we just need to go to the GBIF or any of the many repositories of, of occurrence data and download the data. Seems uh, that it's very easy and nowadays is much easier than 20 years ago since there are uh, hundreds of millions, actually thousands of millions of data publicly available on, on online. However, um, it is not as simple as, as that. And of course, we also need the, the electronic layers with environmental data. And there was a presentation just on this topic, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Well, both um, presences and absences live in geography. Uh, in the diagram, it's our, our old friend, the BAM diagram, you remember, A are the xenopoietic variables like climate, soil, topography, things like that. B are the biotic variables like competitors, predators, uh, mutualistic dispersers, things like that. And M is a region that has been accessible to movements by the species. Uh, you can have several types of both presences and absences. Uh, in the little dark circles are the true source populations with a population growth rate positive, and they occur in the intersection of the three circles. However, inside the circle M, you can have uh, sink populations where you can maybe, with a little bit of, of luck, see the individuals of the species, but there are no viable populations. There are no populations with growth rates that are positive. And those are the little uh, white circles, the stars in yellow and the uh, rhombs in red. And you can also have uh, different types of, uh, of absences. Uh, real absences like the um, crosses inside the circles in the three, the, the three places or even false absences, absences that are a mistake, like the one in with a with the, the plus sign with a with a yellow um, background, which takes place inside the region where the species is present for the three reasons that are represented by the A, B and M circles. But the researcher went there and for whatever the reason couldn't detect this, the, the individuals of the species. This is a diagram that Town also used in his presentation. Uh, the first three columns of the diagram represent the circles in the BAM diagram. The first one is accessibility, the second uh, abiotic or xenopoetic suitability, 
and the third is bi biological suitability. Uh, empty means uh, that uh, there is an affirmative to the question of whether that particular region is accessible or suitable or biologically suitable and and the closed circles mean negative so uh, if you go from the first to the second to the third if it is accessible and it is a biotically suitable and it is biotically suitable you will have uh, a region where the species is present but then you have the last two columns uh, is that particular place, has that been visited by an observer? And if so, the observer performed the observation correctly with the right methods at the right period of time? If all those things are true, and they are five things, then you have the record of a true presence. I'm not going to mention that there are even more columns for the data has been digitized, and if it has been digitized, it has been made accessible and all that. Just forget those. But there are many ways where you would have an absence, uh, which is a mistake. For instance, maybe the species is present, so the first three uh, bars have um, empty circles, but and it was visited, but the observer uh, performed uh, the work with insufficient care or whatever, and you have a false absence. Or maybe uh, you the species is not present, but the species is reported as present because of misidentification or whatever. There are many, many ways of having um, errors in this process. And it is the, I will refer you to the, to the Peterson et al. book of 2011, uh, this can be expressed as a probabilistic equation, as it is shown uh, in the uh, to, in the lower left part of the of the graph. So we see that there are many ways of uh, for an absence to take place. Maybe the place uh, the visited place uh, has the wrong climate, or too many competitors, or it's out of range to the species. There are many ways. Uh, and of course, the, the, the methodological ones, maybe the place was visited, but the, the researcher did not do a proper job of observing the, the individuals of the species in question. So maybe are presences simpler? Well, yes, but just, just a little bit. Uh, with correlative niche modeling, one can model whatever you like, biologically or not. Uh, in an area of research, we're interested mostly in two types of things, viable populations or presence of individuals, and you can model both. And often they will coincide, but not always. And it's important to make this distinction between the two. A basic distinction I would like to make is that between observing just individuals and whether they represent a viable population. Presences are just a number. Higher than one is a presence. But viable populations are more about a rate. Uh, remember your basic ecology. A local population grows in a simplified way by just four reasons. Uh, birds, deaths, immigration and emigration. The first two terms in the equation that I am presenting there are the, grow, the intrinsic growth rate, which is R, uh, and the uh, competition by individuals of the same species, which is represented by the negative term AN. So that part is the growth rate. And the sum is the, all, the sum of all the individuals leaving the, the, the a particular spot and those arriving by dispersal. And if you have just a positive uh, term in R, then the population is a source population, meaning that it produces individuals uh, above zero. Uh, however, if you have a negative value for R, you still may be able to find individuals if the sum there, the term uh, of immigration minus emigration, is positive enough. 
and that is the difference between sink and source populations. It's a very important distinction. Uh, it's, it's based on population ecology and you won't be able to distinguish the two using only GBIF data. So what are we modeling when we use GBIF or a similar data source? Um, these data sources do not distinguish sources from sink populations. So it is up to us to make the difference. Uh, that means that you need to use your knowledge of a species to clean the data set first before modeling to get rid either of mistakes, mistakes meaning things like, for instance, a wrong faulty um, georeferencing or taxonomic identification, or points that don't make sense from your perspective. If you are interested in just in sync populations, well, it, it would be a good idea to get rid of source, uh, um, I mean, of sync populations uh, that are uh, the result of vagrancy or migration or wintering or things like that. It may be perfectly feasibly that you want to model that, that you want to model the wintering range, for instance, of a migratory species, and you can do it. But then you have to, to distinguish what populations, what uh, GBIF data represent the, the, the reproductive range and what species, uh, species uh, presences come from the wintering range, which would be from uh, a demographic perspective, a sink population because there is no, there are no viable populations. Now, what is more likely to be sampled? For this, we need a little bit more theory. We have been focusing on geographic space, but what happens in environmental space? Well, in environmental space, it may well be the case that you are with the same niche breadth, same shape, and the same size of the niche. Uh, you are in, in different regions of environmental space, and therefore your samples will come from very different, uh, with, with diff very different biases. Uh, as you can see in the graph there, there are four ellipse, ellipsoids called A, B, C, and D, each one corresponding to a different region of the world and therefore to different regions in environmental space. And you can see that uh, you are sampling completely different uh, sources of bias if you are in ellipsoid uh, D or in ellipsoid C. Maybe your, your bias, or rather your sampling, was very well defined in geographic space and you have uh, points that are randomly distributed in geographic space, but that doesn't mean that they are going to be randomly distributed in environmental space. Look, for instance, to the ellipsoid uh, uh, labeled C, the blue one. Uh, most of the environments for that ellipsoid occur in a narrow band, a little bit to the right of the centroid. So most uh, samples, if you do the sampling, uh, are going to come from just that part of the environmental region. There are no points in the left and lower part of the ellipsoid because there are no environments uh, with that combinations today uh, on the planet. So um, changing the position of the fundamental niche changes in very drastic ways, uh, not, not only how biased your sample is going to be, but also how um, how different the, 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 the points are going to affect the fitness of the species. Do you remember that we spoke about how uh, the niches have a fitness structure and we hypothesized, it's a very attractive hypothesis and probably with evidence, that closer to the centroid fitness is going to be higher and away from the centroid towards the periphery of the niche, the, 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 the fitness is going to be lower. So that means that if you're in circle D, for instance, 
where you are sampling, most of the possibilities are present. And if you get a, a random sample of points inside D, you're going to get also a random sample of fitnesses. And also, um, since fitness often is related to abundance, that you are going to get more points. Um, it's easier to sample because populations are more abundant, regions close to the centroid and close to the periphery. But if you are in, in, in ellipsoid C, the pale blue one, then you are going to get a sample on just a region of fitness space. And if you are in, in ellipsoid A, you are going to be sampling mostly areas with that today are low in fitness because that's where most of the points are. So uh, depending on where the niche is in environmental space, and of course, we normally don't know where it is, uh, you are going to get with higher probability uh, regions closer to the centroid because higher abundance there or basically uh, regions that represent low fitness uh, in the in niche space. This is a very complicated problem and we don't have a solution right now to how to, to know uh, where in niche space you are sampling. Um, well, what do we conclude from all that? Absences and presences are very different types of data. We need to treat both accordingly because they are different. And that um, like very straightforwardly means that we should trust more a presence than an absence. There are fewer ways of getting a presence than of getting an absence. And of course, this has implications for testing uh, uh, the fit of a model or assessing its performance. Uh, unfortunately, many of the tests that are based on so-called confusion matrices assign the same value to presences or to absences, and they don't have the same value. I would trust a presence from a reliable source much more than an absence. It, it, they mean different things. And there are many ways of getting absences are, and few ways of getting presences. Now, second, uh, considering that aggregated databases like GBIF and many others are not free of certain types of errors and do not distinguish sources from sinks, it is up to you, to the user, to do the cleaning of the data before uh, beginning uh, using a database, it is a serious mistake to just download the data and proceed to 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 to, to model without first having spent some time uh, cleaning the data. Finally, consider that it is likely that occurrences and their biases look different in each space than in geography. Uh, we tend to think of bias as something that occurs only in geography, uh, but it is not the case. It may well be that in geography, points are unbiased and very biased in, in, in environmental space or vice versa. Maybe you sampled across a, a highway that crosses a mountain range and you are highly biased in geography, but not so much in environmental space. So um, check occurrence data in niche space because that is what matters for niche modeling.